Well, thank you all, and good evening to the Focus World. I am delighted to be with you. It's my first time at one of these Focus gatherings. They're legendary, of course, across the country. So to be here and just to see all of you is uplifting to my Catholic soul. So thank you for your presence and for your ministry. You know, honestly, I don't know any other group or institution in the Catholic Church today that's fulfilling its mission and living up to its charism more than focus. I really mean that. I think it's one of the great manifestations of the Spirit in the life of the church today. And I've, I've known a lot of focus uh, people over the years, and in fact, I've taught a number at the seminary who've gone into the priesthood. Here's my favorite focus story as I start. About, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I was in Phoenix at the University of Arizona. And there was a, uh, a little gaggle of focus of missionaries there who came to church one day. And there they were, all energetic and, you know, smart and full of the spirit. And uh, I said, well, what's your, what's your project this year? And they said, we want to convert the most popular person on campus. I said, well, who is it? And they said, the quarterback of the football team. And so they were meeting every morning to pray and, and pray for his conversion. So I said, uh, how's it going? And they said, well, we haven't converted him yet, but we converted his girlfriend and his roommate. <laughs> and so I said, well, you got him surrounded. You know, I mean, it's just a matter of time. But I've always sensed that with the focus folks, this tremendous uh, enthusiasm, tremendous focus, pun intended. So thank you, everybody, for having me. Thank you. Hey, listen, I got, I got very good news for you. I had prepared about a 45-minute presentation, so just very casually backstage, I said to one of the organizers, well, so I, I'm going to go for about 45 minutes, and her face kind of went white, and she goes, you have 18 minutes. So uh, I now have 15 minutes, I'm noticing. So you're going to get a little portion of my talk, if that's okay. Um, you know, one thing I'm not going to talk about at all are the statistics about the nuns, you know, the N-O-N-E-S, all the people today who are leaving organized religion. I've written a lot about that, spoken about it, so go online, you can find all that. You know the statistics are uh, depressing. The one that always stays in my mind is that among young Catholics under 30, now fully 50% identify as nuns, as having no religion. So we got our work cut out for us, and you all know that. And I'm not going to go into more um, sociology with you. What I want to do in the brief time I have is talk about the Acts of the Apostles. So you know, whenever I think about evangelization or the mission of the church, I think go back to this great biblical text that gives us the template that sets the, the agenda for us. And that's the Acts of the Apostles. I'll just say a couple things now in the time I have. Here's the first thing to notice about the Acts of the Apostles. It tells us, everybody, very clearly who's in charge. And what I mean here is the ascended Christ who now commands his church. So listen how this second volume of Luke's great masterpiece begins. He reminds his friend Theophilus, we're not sure who Theophilus was, but he says, of everything that Jesus initiated, both as practice and teaching, until the day he was taken up, having issued instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. That's the whole church now, if we attend to those words. What's our job, everybody? It's simply to continue doing what Jesus did and speaking what he spoke. 2,000 years ago, the Logos takes to himself a human nature. It's the incarnation. But now the risen and ascended Christ takes to himself a mystical body. Where his hands and his feet, his eyes, his tongue, his speech. And our job is to do exactly what he did and to speak what he spoke. And this is why it's very important that the very first thing that Luke tells us about in Acts is the ascension of Jesus. Now, here's the trouble with the ascension. A lot of us think of the ascension as Jesus going up, up, and away, <laughs> right? 
Now, some in this room, probably very few, are old enough to remember this old pop song called Up, Up, and Away. But that's precisely how not to understand the ascension. As though Jesus now has gone away. Goodbye, Jesus. No, rather think of it this way. The way in the, in the pre-modern period, the way a military commander would go to a height so as to survey and command the whole field of battle. From that heightened position, he could more effectively command the troops. And so the risen Christ ascends and sits at the right hand of the Father, right? That's not just an abstraction. Sitting at the right hand of the Father, he's in the position of command. Through the Holy Spirit, the ascended risen Christ commands his mystical body, the church, to do what he did and to say what he said. That's it, everybody. That's the task of the church to the present day. Every one of you, in some way, has been sent by that commander, has been given orders to do the work of the church. Right after the ascension comes Pentecost. The ascension, something of earth now going into the heavenly realm. Pentecost, something of heaven coming down to earth. See, there's the church. Under the command of the ascended Christ, the church now brings the power of heaven to earth. In a myriad ways, according to your particular missions, You bring something of heaven to earth, doing as Jesus did. Okay, now here's the one thing I'm going to talk about with you as we try to make this more specific. The church under the command of Christ engages in bold speech. Bold speech. So on the day of Pentecost, as the Spirit rushes on the apostles, the symbol of the tongues as a fire settle over their heads. And then they burst forth and they speak to the Jews who had come from all corners of the world. In fact, if you look at Luke's description, imagine Jerusalem in the middle, and then he describes people from various points, and they form a kind of ellipse around Jerusalem. The idea is the word going out now to all the nations of the world. You know, last September, uh, Scott Hahn himself, the great Bible scholar, came to L.A., where I'm based, and he gave a a morning of reflection. And afterwards, he came to my room at the cathedral, and we spoke for about a half hour. And I was very gratified to hear this from Scott Hahn himself, that there's no historical ground for the claim that St. Francis said, preach always, and when necessary, use words. You ever hear that phrase? Preach always, and when necessary, use words. I've always had a kind of cordial dislike of that statement. And so I was very happy to hear that St. Francis didn't actually say it. Now, (laughs) here's why. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I get it. I get it. You know, that our whole life should witness to Christ and our whole life should be a kind of preaching. I understand. But see, here's the danger, I think. The danger is that statement can be used as a justification for a kind of anti-intellectualism. It can be used as a justification for a kind of pastoral reductionism. I mean, look, you know, what it really all comes down to is taking care of the poor. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all in favor of taking care of the poor. I'm totally in favor of it. But let's be honest. I mean, a a Jew, a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Muslim, heck, even an atheist of goodwill can be devoted to the poor. My point is that in itself can never be evangelically sufficient. No, no, the church engages from the beginning in bold, fiery, coherent, confident and intelligent speech. And listen, you know this, and if anyone's paid any attention to my work, you know this. 
This is not the time for anti-intellectualism in our church. This is not the time for anti-intellectualism in our church. We have lots of young people, you know them, they're your colleagues and friends, who are leaving the church for intellectual reasons. You know, that it's opposed to science, or it doesn't make sense, or it's old mythology. No, no, we need people, and you're the, I nominate all of you. We need people to have tongues of fire settle over their heads so they can engage in this bold speech. Okay, what's at the heart of the speech? Listen to this now from Luke. Therefore, let the whole house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him, Christ, both Lord and anointed, this Jesus whom you crucified. There's some of the earliest preaching of the church, some of the earliest charismatic proclamation. Let the whole house of Israel know with certainty. God has made him both Lord and anointed, this Jesus whom you crucified. Listen now. At the heart of our bold speech is the proclamation that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what he says here, Lord and anointed, Mashiach, Kyrios and Christos. Kyrios. What was the watchword of the time? Kaiser Kyrios. Caesar's the Lord. He's the one to whom my final allegiance is due. The bold speech of the church is not Kaiser or any of his colleagues or predecessors or successors, but rather Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the King. And he's also Christos, anointed. A Jewish audience would have gotten that right away, wouldn't they? It means he's the real and new David, the king. You know, here's something everyone to pay attention to. Rome was actually pretty liberal in its policies towards rival religions. Rome kind of generously took in a lot of religions. How come it opposed early Christianity so violently? How come the first disciples were hounded to their deaths? Because they declared boldly, coherently, intelligently, confidently, the Lordship of Jesus. If he's Lord, no one else is Lord. If he's Lord, everything in your life belongs to him. Your personal life, yes. Your body, yes. Your friendships, yes. Your political life, yes. Your entertainment, yes, all of it. He's not just one figure among many, not one more sage in a long line of sages and prophets, but he's Lord and Christ. You see now why Caesar tried to kill the first Christians. Here's something I've always loved. Um, this was said by an Anglican bishop of the last century. He said, when Paul preached, there were riots. When I preach, they serve me tea. <laughs> That's what happens to a weakened, attenuated Christianity. A Christianity trading only in bland spiritual teachings. Only saying what can be heard anywhere else in the popular culture. That kind of speech, everybody, is not fiery speech, not bold speech. And in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear that when those first disciples spoke, people were cut to the heart. Still true. Still true to this day. Bland spiritual teachings, saying what everybody else says, that won't cut anyone to the heart. But trust me, declaring the lordship of Jesus, that'll cut them to the heart. Here's the second thing. In my three minutes I got left, here's the second thing I want to say about bold speech. All throughout the Acts of the Apostles, they make reference to the Old Testament. You will not understand the Lordship of Jesus apart from the Old Testament. Listen now to Peter on Pentecost morning. 
Yes, in those days, he's quoting the prophet Joel, I will pour forth my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall dream dreams. Chapter 3, Peter chides his fellow Israelites. Listen, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over. He goes on, God fulfilled that which he announced beforehand through the mouth of his prophets that the anointed one would suffer. And then take out your Bibles when you get back to your rooms tonight and look up that magnificent speech that St. Stephen gives in chapter 7 of Acts. Remember when he's, he's brought before the Sanhedrin and it says his face was like that of an angel and he speaks of the whole history of Israel, beginning with Abraham and the patriarchs, coming up through Joseph and Moses, the burning bush, moving on through the Exodus, the miracle at the Red Sea, the worship of the golden calf, the tent of meeting in the desert, the conquest by Joshua, the building of the great temple, the coming of the prophets. And then he sees Jesus as the culmination of that great history of Israel. That's how you evangelize everybody. When Jesus is cut off from his Israelite roots, he does devolve very quickly into just one more philosopher or one more wise figure. Now read Deepak Chopra or anything by Oprah Winfrey, any of that stuff, you'll get that flattened out, uninspiring Jesus. But trust me when I tell you, trust me when I tell you, when you present Jesus as the fulfillment of the great story of Israel, Jesus as the fulfillment of the temple that was meant to bring divinity and humanity together, when you preach him as the fulfillment of the law and the covenant and the Torah, when you preach him as the culmination of all of the proclamation of the prophets, people will be cut to the heart. Their hearts will catch fire within them. You know, in a way, maybe those who have a, a background in drama, it's like acting in, in Act 5 of, of Hamlet and having no idea what went on in Acts 1 through 4. You know, I mean, if you're acting in Act 5, you've got to know what happened in the earlier part of the story. Because, see, where are we in this story, everybody? We are in the last act of the great drama. Creation, the fall, the formation of a people Israel, and then the coming of the Mashiach, the Christ, the Messiah, who now, listen, in his ascended state, commands his church to continue his work. When you declare Christ that way, we'll get it. People will get it. And hearts will catch fire. That's why, you know, in the, um, in the ancient church, there was a heresy called Marcionism, named for this figure, Marcion, who, who wanted just to get rid of the Old Testament. Just, just preach the New Testament. This Old Testament business of the, you know, the angry, violent God, get rid of all that. Well, the church resisted it. Read people like St. Irenaeus in the second century. The church resisted Marcionism. Marcionism is alive and well today, isn't it? People, same thing, impatient with the God of the Old Testament, angry, violent. But when you try to tell the story of Jesus apart from the Old Testament, you will not get him. You know, maybe, I'll, i got to close here. Uh, I've told this story before, so if you've heard it, I apologize. But this is some years ago when I was at my Word on Fire office here in Chicago. And this uh, a young lady that worked for us came in with her daughter, Josie, who was nine at the time. And Josie, like a lot of little kids, was a big Star Wars fan, right? So her mother said, hey, tell Father Bob all about Star Wars. So this little nine-year-old girl begins to recount the great story <laughs> of George Lucas. You know what I mean? and, and, and she had 
every little detail of the story. I mean, I got the main lines of it, but I mean, she was going way beyond what I knew from, from 25 years ago. Every plot and subplot, every minor, minor character. When she finished her little account, I said to her mother, don't tell me the kids can't understand the Bible. <laughs> this great rollicking, complex, rich story that we have. Full of weird names, yeah, but no weirder than, than Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? When the kids have no trouble with that. <laughs> don't tell me they can't understand the Bible. And therefore, don't tell me they can't appreciate Jesus as the culmination of that great story. So, the ascended Jesus. That's why we pray, everybody, isn't it? We communed with him now at this very place a few hours ago. Listen to his word. Lord, what do you want? Command me. Tell me. Speak, Lord, I'm listening. Plant your word down deep in me. That's the whole Christian life of prayer in some ways, is to listen to the commands coming from the ascended Christ. One of those commands, and boy, this room, we'd set this whole city on fire, wouldn't we? If the people in this room could be filled with those, those tongues of fire. Remind the world who its king is. Remind the world whom they are to worship. See, because everyone worships somebody or something. Everyone's got a king, right? Our job is to stand up boldly and say, no, Christ is king. Everything in your life belongs to him. And tell the great story, tell the great story, grounding it in the narrative of Israel. Then I think, everybody, your hearts will catch fire. And you will allow the fire of the Holy Spirit to take over the society. Listen, God bless you in your work. I believe in you. I believe in what Focus does. All those who've been drawn here because of Focus missionaries, take seriously that perhaps you're hearing the command of the ascended Christ precisely through them. God bless you in your work, everybody. Keep praying for me. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.